Hello everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Rachel. Um, today we're going to do uh, chapter 22 of A Tale of Two Cities. The Sea Still Rises. I believe it's like 18 minutes, I'm not positive. Um, so let's get on with it, shall we? I hope everybody's doing well. The Sea Still Rises. Haggard St. Antoine had had only one exultant week in which to soften his modicum of hard and bitter bread to such extent as he could, with the relish of fraternal embraces and congratulations, when Madame Defarge sat at her counter as usual, presiding over the customers. Madame Defarge wore no rose in her head, for the great extremely chary of trusting themselves to the saint's mercy. The lamps across his streets had a portentously elastic swing with them. Madame Defarge, with her arms folded, sat in the morning light and heat, contemplating the wine shop and the street. In both there were several knots of loungers, squalid and miserable, but now with a manifest sense of power enthroned on their distress. The raggedest nightcap, awry on the wretchedest head, had this crooked significance in it. I know how hard it has grown for me, the wearer of this, to support life in myself. But do you know how easy it has grown for me, the wearer of this, to destroy life in you? Every lean, bare arm that had been without work before had this work always ready for it now, that it could strike. The fingers of the knitting women were vicious, with the experience that they could tear. There was a change in the appearance of St. Antoine. The image had been hammering into this for hundreds of years, and the last finishing blows had told mightily on the expression. Madame Defarge sat observing it with such suppressed approval as was to be desired in the leader of the St. Antoine women. One of her sisterhood knitted beside her, the short, rather plump wife of a starved grocer, and the mother of two children withal. This lieutenant had already earned the complimentary name of the Vengeance. Hark, said the vengeance, listen then, who comes? As if a train of powder laid from the outermost bound of the St. Antoine quarter to the wine shop door had been suddenly fired, a fast spreading murmur came rushing along. It is Defarge, said Madame. Silence, patriots. Defarge came in breathless, pulled off a red cap he wore, and looked around him. Listen everywhere, said Madame again. Listen to him. Bar stood panting against a background of eager eyes and open mouths formed outside the door. All those within the wine shop had sprung to their feet. Say then, my husband, what is it? News from the other world. How then, cried Madame contemptuously, the other world? Does everybody here recall old Foulon, who told the famished people that they might eat grass, and who died and went to hell? Everybody from all throats. The news is of him. He is among us. Among us, from the universal throat again. And dead? Not dead. He feared us so much, and with reason, that he caused himself to be represented as dead, and had a grand mock funeral. But they have found him alive, hiding in the country, and have brought him in. I have seen him but now, on his way to the Hotel de Ville, a prisoner. Have I said he had reason to fear us? Say all. Had he reason? wretched old sinner of more than three score years and ten, if he had never known it yet, he would have known it in his heart of hearts if he could have heard the answering cry. A moment of profound silence followed. Defarge and his wife looked steadfastly at one another. The vengeance stooped, and the jar of a drum was heard as she moved it at her feet behind the counter. Patriots, said Defarge in a determined voice, are we ready? Instantly, Madame Defarge's knife was in her girdle. The drum was beating in the streets as if it and a drummer had flown together by magic. And the vengeance, uttering terrific shrieks and flinging her arms about her head like all the forty furies at once, was tearing from house to house, rousing the women. The men were terrible in the bloody-minded anger with which they looked from windows, caught up what arms they had and came pouring down into the streets. But the women were a sight to chill the boldest. From such household occupations as their bare poverty yielded, 
from their children, from their aged and their sick, crouching on the bare ground, famished and naked. They ran out with streaming hair, urging one another and themselves to madness with the wildest cries and actions. Then on Foulon taken, my sister. On Foulon taken, my mother. Miscreant Foulon taken, my daughter. Then a score of others ran into the midst of these, beating their breasts, tearing their hair and screaming, Foulon alive! Foulon who told the starving people they might eat grass. Foulon who told my old father that he might eat grass when I had no bread to give him. Foulon who told my baby it might suck grass when these breasts were dry with one. O oh, mother of God, this Foulon, O oh, heaven, our suffering, hear me, my dead baby and my withered father. I swear on my knees, on these stones, to avenge you on Foulon. Husbands and brothers and young men, give us the blood of Foulon. Give us the heart of Foulon. Give us the body and soul of Foulon. Rend Foulon to pieces and dig him into the ground that grass may grow from him. With these cries, numbers of the women, lashed into blind frenzy, whirled about, striking and tearing at their own friends until they dropped into a passionate swoon and were only saved by the men belonging to them from being trampled underfoot. Nevertheless, not a moment was lost, not a moment. This Foulon was at the Hotel de Ville and might be loosed. Never if Saint Antoine knew his own sufferings, insults, and wrongs. Armed men and women flocked out of the quarter so fast and drew even these last dregs after them with such a force of suction that within a quarter of an hour there was not a human creature in St. Antoine's bosom, but a few old crones and the wailing children. No, they were all by that time choking the hall of examination where this old man, ugly and wicked, was, and overflowing into the adjacent open space and streets. The Defarges, husband and wife, the Vengeance, the Jacques Three, were in the first press and at no great distance from him in the hall. See, cried Madame, pointing with her knife, see the old villain bound with ropes. That was well done to tie a bunch of grass upon his back. Ha ha! That was well done. Let him eat it now. Madame put her knife under her arm and clapped her hands as at a play. The people immediately behind Madame Dufarge, explaining the cause of her satisfaction to those behind them, and those again explaining to others and those to others, the neighboring streets resounded with the clapping of hands. Similarly, during two or three hours of drawl and the winnowing of many bushels of words, Madame Defarge's frequent expressions of impatience were taken up with marvelous quickness at a distance, the more readily because certain men who had by some wonderful exercise of agility climbed up the external architecture to look in from the windows knew Madame Defarge well and acted as a telegraph between her and the crowd outside the building. At length the sun rose up so high that it struck a kindly ray as of hope or protection directly down upon the old prisoner's head. The favor was too much to bear. In an instant the barrier of dust and chaff that had stood surprisingly long went to the winds and Saint Antoine had got him. It was known directly to the furthest confines of the crowd. Defarge had but sprung over a railing and a table, and folded the miserable wretch in a deadly embrace. Madame Defarge had but followed and turned her hand in one of the ropes with which he was tied. The Vengeance and Jacques Three were not yet up with them, and the men at the windows had not yet swooped into the hall like birds of prey from their high perches, when the cry seemed to go up all over the city, Bring him out! Bring him to the lamp! Down and up head foremost on the steps of the building, now on his knees, now on his feet, now on his back, dragged, struck at, and stifled by the bunches of grass and straw that were thrust into his face by hundreds of hands, torn, bruised, panting, bleeding, yet always entreating and beseeching for mercy, now full of vehement agony of action, with a small, clear space about him as the people drew one another back that they might see. Now a log of dead wood drawn through a forest of legs. He was hauled to the nearest street corner where one of the fatal lamps swung. And there Madame Dufarge let him go, as a cat might have done to a mouse, and silently and composedly looked at him while they made ready, and while he besought her. The women passionately screeching at him all the time, and the men sternly calling out to have him killed with grass in his mouth. Once he went aloft, and the 
rope broke, and they caught him shrieking. Twice he went aloft, and the rope broke, and they caught him shrieking. Then the rope was merciful and held him, and his head was soon upon a pike, with grass enough in the mouth for all St. Antoine to dance at the sight of. Nor was this the end of the day's bad work. For St. Antoine so shouted and danced his angry blood up that it boiled again on hearing when the day closed that in the son-in-law of the dispatched, another of the people's enemies and insulters was coming into Paris under a guard 500 strong in cavalry alone. St. Antoine wrote his crimes on flaring sheets of paper, seized him, would have torn him out of the breast of an army to bear Foulon company, set his head and heart on pikes, and carried the three spoils of the day in wolf procession through the streets. Not before dark did the men and women come back to the children, wailing and breadless. Then the miserable baker shops were beset by long files of them, patiently waiting to buy bad bread. And while they waited, with stomachs faint and empty, they beguiled the time by embracing one another on the triumphs of the day, and achieving them again in gossip. Gradually, these streams of ragged people shortened and frayed away, and then poor lights began to shine in high windows, and slender fires were made in the streets at which neighbors cooked in common, afterwards supping at their doors. Scanty and insufficient suppers those, and innocent of meat, as of most other sauce to wretched bread. Yet human fellowship is some nourishment into the flinty viands, and struck some sparks of cheerfulness out of them. Fathers and mothers who had had their full share in the worst of the day played gently with their meager children, and lovers with such a world around them and before them loved and hoped. It was almost morning when Defarge's wine shop parted with its last knot of customers, and Monsieur Defarge said to Madame his wife in husky tones while fastening the door, At last it is come, my dear. Eh, well, returned Madame. Almost. Saint Antoine slept. The Defarges slept. Even the Vengeance slept with her starved grocer, and the drum was at rest. The drum was the only voice in St. Antoine that blood and hurry had not changed. The vengeance, as custodian of the drum, could have wakened him up and had the same speech out of him as before the Bastille fell, or old Foulon was seized. Not so with the hoarse tones of the men and women in St. Antoine's bosom. End of chapter 22 By Charles Dickens Book 2 Chapter 23 Fire Rises There was a change on the village where the fountain fell, and where the mender of roads went forth daily to hammer out of the stones on the highway such morsels of bread as might serve for patches to hold his poor ignorant soul and his poor reduced body together. The prison on the crag was not so dominant as of yore. There were soldiers to guard it, but not many. There were officers to guard the soldiers, but not one of them knew what his men would do. Beyond this, that it would probably not be what he was ordered. Far and wide lay a ruined country, yielding nothing but desolation. Every green leaf, every blade of grass and blade of grain was as shriveled and poor as the miserable people. Everything was bowed down, dejected, oppressed, and broken. Habitations, fences, domesticated animals, men, women, children, and the soil that bore them, all worn out. Monsignor, often a most worthy individual gentleman, was a national blessing, gave a chivalrous tone to things, was a polite example of luxurious and shining life, and a great deal more to equal purpose. Nevertheless, Monsignor of a class had, somehow or other, brought things to this. Strange that creation, designed expressly for Monsignor, should be so soon drunk dry and squeezed out. There must be something short-sighted in the eternal arrangements, surely. Thus it was, however, and the last drop of blood having been extracted from the flints, and the last screw of the rack having been turned 
burnt so often that its perches crumbled, and it now turned and turned with nothing to bite. Monsignor began to run away from a phenomenon so low and unaccountable. But this was not the change on the village, and on many a village like it. For scores of years gone by, Monsignor had squeezed it and wrung it, and had seldom graced it with his presence, except for the pleasures of the chase. Now found in hunting the people, now found in hunting the beasts, for whose preservation Monsignor made edifying spaces of barbarous and barren wilderness. No, the change consisted in the appearance of strange faces of low caste, rather than in the disappearance of the high caste, chiseled, and otherwise beautified and beautifying features of Monsignor. For in these times, as the mender of roads worked solitary, in the dust, not often troubling himself to reflect that dust he was, and to dust he must return, being for the most part too much occupied in thinking how little he had for supper, and how much more he would eat if he had it. In these times, as he raised his eyes from his lonely labor and viewed the prospect, he would see some rough figure approaching on foot, the like of which was once a rarity in those parts, but was now a frequent presence. As it advanced, the mender of roads would discern without surprise that it was a shaggy-haired man of almost barbarian aspect, tall, in wooden shoes that were clumsy even to the eyes of a mender of roads, grim, rough, swart, steeped in the mud and dust of many highways, dank with the marshy moisture of many low grounds, sprinkled with the thorns and leaves and moss of many byways through woods. Such a man came upon him like a ghost at noon in the July weather, as he sat on his heap of stones under a bank, taking such shelter as he could get from a shower of hail. The man looked at him, looked at the village in the hollow, at the mill, and at the prison on the crag. When he had identified these objects in what benighted mind he had, he said, in a dialect that was just intelligible, How goes it, Jacques? All well, Jacques. Touch then. They joined hands, and the man sat down on the heap of stones. No dinner? Nothing but supper now, said the mender of roads, with a hungry face. It is the fashion, growled the man. I meet no dinner anywhere. He took out a blackened pipe, filled it, lighted it with flint and steel, pulled at it until it was in a bright glow, then suddenly held it from him and dropped something into it from between his finger and thumb that blazed and went out in a puff of smoke. Touch, then. It was the turn of the mender of roads to say it this time, after observing these operations. They again joined hands. Tonight, said the mender of roads. Tonight, said the man, putting the pipe in his mouth. Where? Here. He and the mender of roads sat on the heap of stones, looking silently at one another, with the hail driving in between them like a pygmy charge of bayonets, until the sky began to clear over the village. Show me, said the traveler then, moving to the brow of the hill. See, returned the mender of roads with extended finger. You go down to here and straight through the street and past the fountain. To the devil with all that, interrupted the other, rolling his eye over the landscape. I go through no streets and past no fountain. Well, well, about two leagues beyond the summit of that hill above the village. Good. When do you cease to work? At sunset. Will you wake me before departing? I have walked two nights without resting. Let me finish my pipe, and I shall 
Does the road vendor ply his dusty labor, and the hail clouds rolling away reveal the bright bars and streaks of sky, which were responded to by silver gleams upon the landscape? The little man, who wore a red cap now in place of his blue one, seemed fascinated by the figure on the heap of stones. His eyes were so often turned towards it that he used his tools mechanically, and one would have said to very poor account. The bronze face, the shiny black hair and beard, the coarse woolen red cap, the rough medley dress of homespun stuff and hairy skins of beasts, the powerful frame attenuated by spare living, and the sullen and desperate compression of the lips in sleep, inspired the mender of roads with awe. The traveler had traveled far, and his feet were footsore, and his ankles chafed and bleeding. His great shoes, stuffed with leaves and grass, had been heavy to drag over the many long leagues, and his clothes were chafed into holes, as he himself was into sores. Stooping down beside him, the road mender tried to get a peep at secret weapons in his breast or where not, but in vain for he slept with his arms crossed upon him, and set as resolutely as his lips. Fortified towns with their stockades, guardhouses, gates, trenches, and drawbridges, seemed to the mender of roads to be so much air as against this figure. And when he lifted his eyes from it to the horizon and looked around, he saw in his small fancy similar figures stopped by no obstacle, tending to centers all over France. The man slept on, indifferent to showers of hail and intervals of brightness, to sunshine on his face and shadow, to the paltering lumps of dull ice on his body and the diamonds into which the sun changed them, until the sun was low in the west and the sky was glowing. Then the mender of roads, having got his tools together and all things ready, go down into the village, roused him. Good, said the sleeper, rising on his elbow. Two leagues beyond the summit of the hill? About. About. Good. The mender of roads went home, with the dust going on before him, according to the set of the wind, and was soon at the fountain, squeezing himself in among the lean kind brought there to drink, and appearing whisper to them, in his whispering to all the village. When the village had taken its poor supper, it did not creep to bed, as it usually did, but came out of doors again, and remained there. A curious contagion of whispering was upon it, and also, when it gathered together at the fountain in the dark, another curious contagion of looking expectantly at the sky in one direction only. Monsieur Gabel, chief functionary of the place, became uneasy, went out on his housetop alone, and looked in that direction too, glanced down from behind his chimneys at the darkening faces by the fountain below, and sent word to the sacristan who kept the keys of the church that there might be need to ring the coxswain by and by. The night Ironing the old chateau, keeping its solitary state apart, moved in a rising wind, as though they threatened the pile of building massive and dark in the gloom. Up the two terrace flights of steps, the rain ran wildly, and beat at the great door, like a swift messenger rousing those within. Uneasy rushes of wind went through the hall, among the old spears and knives, and passed lamenting up the stairs, and shook the curtains of the bed where the last marquee had slept. East, west, north, and south, through the woods, four heavy-treading, unkempt figures crushed the high grass 
trampling of a horse and riding away. There was spurring and slashing through the darkness, and bridle was drawn in the space by the village fountain, and the horse in a foam stood at Monsieur Gabel's door. Help, Gabel! Help, everyone! The tocsin rang impatiently, but other help, if that were any, there was none. The mender of roads and two hundred and fifty particular friends stood with folded arms at the fountain, looking at the pillar of fire in the sky. It must be forty feet high, said they grimly, and never moved. The rider from the chateau and the horse in a foam clattered away through the village and galloped up the stony steep to the prison on the crag. At the gate, a group of officers were looking at the fire, removed from them a group of soldiers. Help, gentlemen, officers! The chateau is on fire. Valuable objects may be saved from the flames by kindly aid. Help, help! The officers looked towards the soldiers, who looked at the fire, gave no orders, and answered with shrugs and biting of lips. It must burn. As the rider rattled down the hill again and through the street, the village was illuminating. The mender of roads and the two hundred and fifty particular friends, inspired as one man and woman by the idea of lighting up, had darted into their houses and were putting candles in every dull little pane of glass. The general scarcity of everything occasioned candles to be borrowed in a rather peremptory manner of Monsieur Cabell's, and in a moment of reluctance and hesitation on that functionary's part, the mender of roads once so submissive to authority, had remarked that carriages were good to make bonfires with, and that post horses would roast. The chateau was left to itself to flame and burn. In the roaring and raging of the conflagration, a red-hot wind driving straight from the infernal regions seemed to be blowing the edifice away. With the rising and falling of the blaze, the stone faces showed as if they were in torment. When great masses of stone and timber fell, the face with the two dints in the nose became obscured. Anon struggled out of the smoke again, as if it were the face of the cruel Marquis, burning at the stake and contending with the fire. The chateau burned. The nearest trees, laid hold of by the fire, scorched and shriveled. Trees at a distance, fired by the four fierce figures, begirt the blazing edifice with a new forest of smoke. Molten lead and iron boiled in the marble basin of the fountain. The water ran dry. The extinguisher tops of the towers vanished like ice before the heat and trickled down into four rugged wells of flame. Great rents and splits branched out in the solid walls like crystallization. Stupefied birds wheeled about and dropped into the furnace. Four fierce figures trudged away, east, west, north, and south, along the night-enshrouded roads, guided by the beacon they had lighted towards their next destination. The illuminated village had seized hold of the toxin, and abolishing the lawful ringer, rang for joy. Not only that, but the village, lightheaded with famine, fire, and bell ringing, and bethinking itself that Monsieur Gabel had to do with a collection of rent and taxes, though it was but a small installment of taxes, and no rent at all that Gabel had got in those latter days, became impatient for an interview with him, and surrounding his house.
<clears throat> a trying suspense. You'd be passing a whole summer night on the brink of the black ocean, ready to take that plunge into it, upon which Mr. Cabell had resolved. But the friendly dawn appearing at last, and the rush candles of the village guttering out, the people happily dispersed, and Monsieur Cabell came down, bringing his life with him for that while. Okay, so that was the end of that, and as you can see, um, I am doing a new diamond painting. I'm doing my Sunflower Girl, because my Sunflower Girl is my favorite, oh, you can see it right here better. S sunflowers are my favorite flower, because I think of peace, and they're bright. So, I wanted to do that. And also, if you could tell, I am doing parchment paper 2x2s. Two um, I got them on Amazon. And the reason I'm doing 2x2s two is because in my reality, I don't know about anybody else's, but in mine, I have to know when my project is about to get done. How many, you know, weeks or days or whatever. This will tell me... Because I have one, two, three, four, five across and seven down. That's 35 days. So it would take me 35 days to do this diamond painting if I do one square a day. If I do two squares, it's only going to take me 15 days. And when I just look at this little spot, it's not overwhelming for me when I have one of those big ones. You know, five by five or... What are, how big they are because I do have the big ones too and it was just getting overwhelming so I just wanted to know because I'm a slow diamond painter and I just wanted to get more diamond painting done for myself so that's why I'm doing it that way so thank you guys for joining me um I hope you all have a good weekend, because this is come, going on Friday, <laughs> um, and we'll see you next time. Don't forget to hit the like button, and if you like my content, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any chapters. Thank you.